I now call to order the Society's 2,405th meeting in the 148th year since its founding in 1871. Good evening, everyone. My name is Larry Milstein. I'm the president of PSW, one of the oldest scientific societies in Washington, D.C., committed to providing a forum to further scientific understanding and inquiry. Welcome to our guests and members to tonight's lecture by Ramis Gopner in the John Wesley Powell Auditorium of the Cosmos Club in Washington, D.C., including our members and friends around the world who are watching the live stream of tonight's meeting on PSW Science's YouTube channel, and to those who may watch the videos of this evening's lecture later on YouTube or on Vimeo, access directly or through our web page. We will begin with a few announcements and then turn to this evening's lecture, followed by a question and answer period. Thereafter, I will present a small thank you gift to our speaker, make a few closing announcements, and adjourn the meeting to the social hour. Please join me in thanking the sponsors of the 2018-2019 lecture series, the Policy Studies Organization in cooperation with the American Public University, and a generous donor who is asked to remain anonymous. I'm a pleased, I am pleased to announce that the following new members have been elected to the society. Bruce Kane, professor of physics at the University of Maryland and a professor in the Joint Quantum Institute there. He is particularly interested in material science and quantum information. He's a good friend of the society who has joined us for many events and who originally was introduced to PSW by his wife, PSW member and lecture sponsor, Erica Kane. Daniel Elton, a staff scientist at NIH, particularly interested in artificial intelligence, computational neuroscience, and physics in general who comes to PSW through the PSW Meetup Group and through PSW member Isaac Schoen. Gerald Lorenz, an attorney and mediator interested in many areas of science and in the history of science, who comes to PSW through the Washington Post originally. And tonight's speaker, Ramesh Gopinath, whose background and interests will be clear to you in some small part from tonight's proceedings Please join me in welcoming them to membership. All new members are empowered to pick up their copy of volume one of the PSW Bulletin. And if any new members are here who have not yet obtained their copy, please see me after the lecture and I will be happy to provide it to you. Because our recording secretary, James Healing, could not be with us tonight, we will not be reading the minutes of the 2,404th meeting and the lecture by Compton Tucker on Cretaceous Earth that was delivered here on February 22, 2019. The minutes will be posted to the website in due course. And for some time thereafter, they will be uh, up for review by members who can email us if they have any comments or corrections. And with that, we now turn to tonight's lecture on blockchains and commerce. And it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Ramesh Gopinath. Ramesh is Vice President for Blockchain Solutions at IBM. He is responsible for the management and development of IBM's blockchain technologies and solutions. Previously, he was the global leader for blockchain at IBM Research where he incubated IBM's blockchain business. Ramesh began his career in IBM research, and over the years, he has led the development of IBM products and services in a broad range of areas, including <coughs> cognitive computation for speech and text, collaboration, software, and mobile and cloud applications. He was instrumental in developing the IBM Food Trust blockchain solution to support food safety that is now being used by many of the world's largest food companies. We will talk about that tonight. And he helped develop IBM's global trade digitization technology. 
currently, currently being used by Maersk and other companies for shipping supply chain management. Ramesh earned his Bachelor of Technology at the Indian Institute of Technology in Chennai and his MS and PhD at Rice University. Please hold questions for the question and answer period at the end of the lecture. And join me now in welcoming Ramesh to the podium. How's everybody doing? Great. Okay, so uh, in the next hour or so, I'll try to give you a high level view of uh, blockchain as application, especially in the enterprise space. In the, you know, and primarily with a couple of examples of solutions that I've been involved in over the past four, you know, three to four years, right? So just to give you a sense of there's a lot going on with blockchain. I think it's a really interesting technology. There is tremendous potential for cross-company collaboration as a broad space that I'll see. And so what is blockchain? And why is it that some of us at least believe that it's going to transform all industries? It comes down to a very simple observation. If you think about any industry, business interactions between multiple parties, how does it occur? You know, it's typically along the lines of what's on the left, the traditional model is companies interact with each other by sending information with point-wise communications. Whether it's done electronically or whether it's done by paper process doesn't matter. That's typically the way in which it happens. Simple example, you know, you have a buyer, you have a seller, and a carrier. Buyer orders something, purchase orders issued, it's to point communication to the seller. Seller might commission a carrier, like FedEx, to deliver to the, to, to, to the buyer. Typically what happens is silos of information leading to disputes, reconciliations, all those inefficiencies. The model on the right does the same thing very differently. All the parties that need to interact with each other send information to a trusted, decentralized data store, let's say, the blockchain. And the advantage here then is the fact that everybody gets to have a single version of the truth, but it's not all. Obviously, these are business interactions, so you know you need to hide certain information from some parties and from others. So you do it with selective visibility, with the right levels of confidentiality, privacy, et cetera, et cetera. That's the key difference. And the source of the trust itself comes from a few properties. And it's very simple. One of the first things is all transactions are digitally signed, which means non-repudiation. You can't say you didn't do that. Right? That's a very important property. The second property is every transaction or every uh, action taken by any business is actually uh, goes through a consensus mechanism where multiple parties come to an agreement. And the final property is there are multiple copies in the hands of uh, different parties, decentralized control. Those are the three key elements to make it trusted. And the decentralization basically means nobody controls that data store or everybody controls the data store. In fact, the right way to think about it is collaboratively, all of them are together managing that data store where you're keeping track of all these transactions, right, that happen. And in this model then, the same problem, a buyer, seller, and a carrier, since everybody has a single version of, you know, the, the state of that business interaction till the goods are delivered and the payment is made, let's say, they basically, you know, the reason for disputes go away. Right, short shipment, damaged goods. These are the typical kind of problems you run into. Those things get eliminated, or at least you know the the you know you can solve it with a relatively small amount of effort. Right, it's not that disputes are completely going to be eliminated with technologies like this. So that's basically what a bl blockchain is. You know, in what I'm describing, right? it's a simple, trusted, decentralized data store for sharing information. Uh, there are. If you uh, look at uh, technologies that are out there, you know, clearly uh, you know, the term blockchain comes from Bitcoin and Ethereum and many other uh, you know, blockchains. And it's a very rich set of blockchain technologies out there. So what I want to, you know, to do was to talk about 
you know, sort of distinction between two broad classes of blockchains, right? So that, you know, lay the groundwork for what exactly are, am I going to be talking about with the rest of uh, this talk. So if you think about uh, a group of entities coming together and managing uh, data in a database or a data store called a blockchain, the first thing is, who are the entities who are managing it? If they are known entities, then you're in the, in the right hand side of this uh, chart, you're what is called a permission blockchain. That's the type of blockchain businesses typically engage in. Because typically for business interactions, you want to store the data in a place where uh, known parties are managing the database, right? The Bitcoin, Ethereum, and many of these other, you know, uh, cryptocurrency based databases, anonymous players. So the identity of the entities that are managing the integrity of the database, they are typically anonymous. And what this also means is why would anonymous participants come together and manage the integrity of a data store for the benefit of others? They, you need to incentivize them. And so there you would begin to see on the left hand side in particular the need for cryptocurrencies. You need some mechanism, some token to ensure that you know, people basically are willing to and are, uh, to uh, manage the integrity of the database. All that is not needed in the permission blockchain. So pretty much everything that I'm going to talk about for the rest of this talk is permissioned blockchains where the blockchain itself is managed by a set of known entities, right? That's the key difference. And so if you look at the permission world, even there, there are many technologies out there, right? And some of them are listed there. And the one that we in IBM basically have been a key part of being responsible for and are contributing to is the Hyperledger fabric from the Linux Foundation. Um, uh, and in fact, we catalyzed the formation of the Linux Foundation Hyperledger project in 2015 because what we had, once we realized that this has a potential to transform many industries, we wanted to, you know, we looked at possibilities of starting with, you know, blockchains that are already out there like Bitcoin and Ethereum and realize we got to build something for, for enterprise use from scratch. And that's basically what led to, you know, our joining the Linux Foundation and contributing to the Hyperledger Fabric project. So while there is a complex set of technologies out there and it's a rich set of technologies, for enterprise use typically you will find you know, the right-hand side column is where uh, the, most, of, most of the effort is. And the good news is it looks like at this point in time, the Hyperledger fabric seems to be getting the most traction. It's most companies like uh, the, the SAPs and the Oracles of the world are coming out with enterprise blockchains based on the Hyperledger fabric technology. Um, so what are companies in who are in the blockchain space doing in terms of where are the investments going? I'll use IBM as an example, but think of it as a just template of how you know where the money is going, right? Typically, companies who are in the blockchain space is doing one of three things. One, uh, it's platform solutions or services in simple terms. Either they are working on the raw, low-level technology, which is you know either work on the you know a technology like the Hyperledger Fabric, which is the real blockchain layer itself, or you know, packaging it to be readily usable by others. So think of it as a managed service using that technology. That's basically the platform layer. And we have, you know, an investment there, which is called the IBM blockchain platform. Same thing with others like Oracle, SAP, et cetera. The second layer is solutions. What do you do with the technology, right? And so that is where I'll spend most of my time. I'll walk through two solutions that I'm responsible for. And then the final piece is services, which really boils down to, you know, we roll up our sleeves and build solutions for others, right? So that's basically the three broad areas that most companies in this space play in. Either you are contributing building a platform, you're either building solutions, leveraging a platform, or you're building solutions for others, meaning services. Yeah. So we in IBM have over the past three years done about 500 plus projects in blockchain so far. And several of them have been successful. There are about 100 plus blockchain solution networks that we have, you know, currently that is operational, right? And uh, this chart just gives you a sampling of some of the areas where we have, uh, you know, 
found value leveraging blockchain technology. And let me give you a couple of examples. And since the rest of the uh, presentation will be on two specific solutions in the supply chain, I wanted to make give you a sense of you know what's happening in other, other industries too in this chart. Take financial services, right? I'll talk about two specific uh, uh, solutions that we have developed that uh, uh, are in production. One is with CLS uh, Bank. CLS Bank is you know, uh, probably a little known bank, but it's, it is a significant player in the sense $5 trillion worth of Forex transactions happen every day with CLS Bank. It, this is not a small bank. What they are using blockchain for is, you know, there are for bilateral netting of, tra of, of actual Forex transactions. That's what they're using a blockchain for, right? A clear case of two banks making in a settlement, they want to make sure both of them are looking at exactly the same data so there's no need for reconciliations and things like that. So that's the reason they're using it. Another example is DTCC, right? Depository Trade and Cl uh, Clearing Corporation. So when you buy stocks, bonds, etc., right? They all typically settle at DTCC eventually. The specific project there is on uh, credit default swaps, right? Again, pairs of banks get together and do these transactions. Think of all the banks that are coming together as a group, as a network, right? And within this network, they run a blockchain uh, platform that is the information sharing platform, which is used for keeping track of these credit default swaps. That's basically the project that, in fact, I think this is going to pr production or already gone to production sometime in, the, in, the, in this quarter or next quarter. So those are two examples in financial services. Right? Another example in financial services, trade finance. If you think about the financing of trade, especially cross-border trade, it's typically a very uh, painful, time-consuming, inefficient process involving letters of credit and things like that. Right? Typically, you have an exporter, importer, and two banks. Right? Exporter's bank and importer's bank. And if you look at the entire workflow around you know, trying to uh, an, ex an importer wants to, you know, to take a loan from one of these banks or take a cre trade credit from one of these banks and go through the process that's significantly convoluted and takes a long time and effort. And to streamline that process, a b set of banks in Europe uh, together create a consortium called V.Trade or V.Trade. And essentially, th th they're running a blockchain solution for uh, for small and medium businesses to get trade financing. So these are some examples in the financial services. There are some other areas also I want to quickly touch upon. Think about even a simple thing like know your customer. When you go to a bank and basically you know, uh, apply for a bank account, let's say, you give a lot of information. If you go to another bank, you provide the same information. Why do that? Why can't banks share that information in a selectively visible fashion so that you know, I, when I go to the second bank, the fact that the first bank did the hard work of verifying me is used for me to onboard myself to a second bank. Again, requires information sharing, and that's a place also where blockchain is very useful. Know your customer is an example of a solution where blockchain is useful. Uh, healthcare, essentially, in a whole bunch of uh, companies, including Anthem, Aetna, et cetera, have come together to form a health utility consortium. This was just announced very recently, and they are trying to build a blockchain solution that brings together payers, providers, and various participants in the healthcare ecosystem to solve various inefficiency and other problems in the healthcare ecosystem, right? These are just examples, even if the details don't come across. As I walk you through the two examples, I'll go in detail. You, the pattern is very similar in all these solutions. And the final uh, area is supply chains, and that's basically the two solutions I'm going to walk you through. So I'll start with the first one. This is essentially in, in, you know, uh, in the food ecosystem. So if you look at you know, you know, the food ecosystem, think of the typical problems that you face in the food ecosystem, right? Everybody is familiar with what happened last year with respect to romaine lettuce during Thanksgiving, right? The FDA said, don't eat romaine lettuce, right? And in fact, it was the second incident last year. We had one earlier in the year too, right? In fact, some people joked that last year was, you know, we had the salmonella summer too, right? The, but if you look at food safety, you know, how, what do you, how do you solve the problem? 
And the answer is, if essentially, and why is there a problem? It's related to the fact that you know the various participants in the farm to table supply chain don't share information with each other. Because if they do share information with each other, then you can imagine a simple scenario of you buy, you know, let's say some romaine lettuce at a Walmart store and, it's, and it made you sick. You can trace it back to where it came from from a farm perspective. And if you know that this is the farm where something went wrong, you can trace forwards to all the places in the supply chain, including maybe a Kroger or a Safeway where the tainted product doesn't and surgically recall. But that doesn't happen because that information sharing doesn't happen. Not enough trust and transparency in the food supply chain. That's not all. Food waste. One third of all food is wasting. It's a mind-boggling number. Somewhere along the supply chain from farm to, you know, the end consumer, one third of all food in this planet is wasted. Now, if you think about how you can solve that problem, there too, by information sharing between the various participants, you know, think about strawberries. They last for 14 days. Right? So if strawberries last for 14 days, if you can rush it through the supply chain and get it in the hands of the end consumer in, let's say, five days as opposed to eight days, that's a significant benefit. Right? So that basically is an example of collaboration, information sharing, leading to a better outcome in the food supply chain. Take, for example, freshness. Fresh beef lasts for, again, something like 14 to 20 days. If you want to get, you know, without, uh, you know, beef going bad, get in the hands of the end consumer, that too requires information. So bottom line is most of these problems in the food supply chain is around trust and transparency. Once you start with the problem set, that determines what is the right ecosystem. To solve the problems in the previous chart, you know, who are the players you need? And this gives you a sampling of all the players you need from the farm to you know, table supply chain, growers, suppliers, packers, logistics companies, even regulators like the FDA perhaps, right? So this is the set of, you know, entities that you want to bring to the table. And each of these entities have their own interests with respect to engaging in the food ecosystem. And end consumer wants, you know, trust and transparency in the food they eat, right? We all want to be sure that the food we eat is safe, right? But Different parties have different needs and, and desires, and that is why information sharing is a little difficult because you need to find aligned incentives for the sharing of information between these participants. So what we did was we identified these problems in the food ecosystem. We identified the ecosystem that we need to bring together. And we, so when you want to convene an ecosystem of P, or entities who will share information, what do you do? So one idea we had was we went to one of the largest players who can potentially pull the ecosystem together, and that's Walmart. So we worked with Walmart, and we sh demonstrated using this technology that you can, in principle, be able to track you know, mangoes, sliced mangoes from, it, as it turns out, it was a package of sliced mangoes from Mexico coming to the United States. The Walmart prides itself of being you know, one of the best in terms of being able to trace. So the head of Walmart Food Safety walked into a store, picked up a slice package, and said, hey, look, you know, tell me where this came from. Took them about a week to figure out how long, you know, to, to figure out exactly where it came from. And in our system, it basically was done in a couple of seconds. And this is no, you know, it's not rocket science. At the end of the day, what we are doing here is every one of the parties is sending information to the system about what they received from upstream, what they did with the items, and what they sent downstream. Now, this is crucial because, you know, uh, in this particular case, it's simple mangoes. But if, if you think about multi-ingredient products like, uh, say, ice cream, what you're saying is if you're an ice cream manufacturer like a Nestle or a Unilever, you would send information suggesting, you know, what l batches of various ingredients like milk and others came in, what they did with it, what batch of new product, ice cream, talenty, whatever was created, and where it was shipped to Kroger, Walmart, whichever retailer, right? That information is sufficient to be able to trace back and forth. That's basically what we do here. And the sharing of the information is really where the blockchain is required because now in the system, you need to have, you know, effectively competitors in the system, so you need to be able to hide information and keep it as uh, you know, secure as possible and with the right level of confidentiality. Okay, so we did this. 
and it was very successful. And so what the next step was, okay, now that we knew that this technology is going to work, we spent the time trying to create what I would call a minimum viable ecosystem. So we got about 12 companies to come together to help us figure out, okay, what should the product do, right? What does it take to create a blockchain-based solution for this purpose? And that's basically what, what we did. So, and so the journey started, like I said, you know, in 2017 after the first pilot. And over the next one year, till 2018 October timeframe, we essentially, you know, uh, got a few key things right. First thing was, you know, make sure that everybody got something out of it, right? So the business model right, get the governance right. People, are, companies are sharing information. So you gotta be uh, certain, comfortable with sharing of the information. So who owns the data? What can I do with the data if I see some data in the system, right? Those are all questions you have to answer. So if, uh, let's say a farmer shared some data with Walmart, that's wonderful. What is Walmart sharing back, right? to the farmer to get some benefit out of this. These are all the questions we had to answer. We got to a point where, you know, in October, we, we felt we were ready to sort of announce the product. So last October, we announced the product called IBM Food Trust. Around the same time, uh, you know, uh, Walmart itself asked all its leafy green suppliers, so romaine lettuce and all that, to join IBM Food Trust uh, in two phases. Immediate suppliers to join by January 31st, so the vast majority of them already in the system. And then by sec September of this year, if all goes well, the entire Walmart leafy green supply chain would be on IBM Food Trust. So hopefully with that, we should at least for Walmart be able to trace back and forward, right, and solve potential issues with respect to food safety in the supply chain, right? So that's basically what we have done over the last, um, you know, we started the journey, like I said, in 2017, over the last couple of years. Not only that, you know, we, Carrefour, who is one of the largest retailers, you know, in 30 countries, has also joined the system, basically, and they have come in with a different uh, uh, um, interest, right? Their first focus was, while well, everything was interesting from recall too, their first interest was to ensure that you know consumers are are. Uh, Consumer trust was the focus for car for. Okay, so how did, you know, so I, I'll play a short video clip just so that you can hear a little bit from some of the ecosystem players in IBM Food Trust. We have a very complex supply chain. One of my biggest fears is that I have all of the information I need to prevent an outbreak and I can't see it because of all the noise, because everything is on paper and I can't connect the dots. What we as an industry need to do is provide that end-to-end -end visibility so that as issues arise, we can depend on each other to deliver information quickly that we can then act on. If you're trying to chase trends, if you're trying to keep up with scarcity, if you're trying to respond to an abundance, taking any time at all to respond means you're already several steps behind. IBM Food Trust is a blockchain system that consists of digitizing information about our food supply chain in a way that's indelible, in a way that is searchable, so that we can have instant access to records that we can have faith in. I believe that the benefits for food safety are just the tip of the iceberg. One third of all food that gets produced is wasted. IBM Food Trust could allow you to optimize supply chain efficiencies, take out days of shelf life, reducing food waste both in store and at home. You're stitching together a transaction flow that by itself is important, but then you add all of these other data from IoT devices and stitch it into the same record. Now you have higher quality, higher visibility to your supply chain and digital records confirming that that should be trusted. Providing safe and affordable food is not only a daunting challenge, but for us, it's an important responsibility. We can trace origin of food products back to source in 2.2 seconds. That's food traceability at the speed of thought. We're expecting improved transparency, improved trust, and improved speed. 
all those are possible with IBM Food Trust and with blockchain, and I hope for more adoption across the food ecosystem. Yeah, so it's early days, but still it's quite exciting because we are beginning to get adoption from the industry at large. So what is IBM Food Trust today? Right, just to give you a sense of what does it do. So this chart is supposed to give you a good sense of that. At the very bottom, you have the, you know, the actual technology itself, of, you know, the blockchain technology that, by the way, just so, it's, so that I connect back to the first couple of chart, it is run by a whole set of companies, a subset of this ecosystem, food ecosystem. Think of the order of you know, a few tens of companies are called trust anchors who run blockchain nodes, you know, these hyperledger fabric nodes. That's the bottom layer. That is the data layer, right? And the IBM Food Trust then is, on top of this data layer, we have created an information sharing platform where various participants, right, from farmers to, you know, by the way, the little farmer may not be running a blockchain node. In fact, most of them are not running blockchain nodes. To them, it's just, you know, sort of a data store that a set of trust tankers are vouching for, right? So they basically, you know, share information, and that's the data sharing layer is basically what is called the IBM Food Trust platform. And what we did next is, on top of this information sharing platform, solved a couple of uh, what I would call example applications. Trace, the one that traces back and forth that we talked about earlier, that's one application. Another application which I did not talk about is a way to share audit and inspection information. The food supply chain, you have inspections of facilities and things like that, or you do testing of uh, uh, you know, um, proteins like meat and poultry for pathogens and stuff. All of that information you share with your business partners. You can do it on, on the I IBM Food Trust solution. That's the second application. A third application that's just coming out end of this month is what I would call fresh insights. For perishables, the name of the game is, like I said earlier, you want to rush the perishables through the supply chain. So important information that's relevant are things like how long did a, an item stay in a certain facility, the dwell time as it's called, or what is the time since harvest, right? Those are all the sort of information that we provide in our fresh insights. Now, all of this information, again, basically is coming from this trusted source, but once you know that this is trusted, the rest of it basically is fairly simple, right, at a higher level. That's what basically the, the layer does. So what we have done then is created the platform. We are assembling the ecosystem in the sense, getting people to onboard themselves. By the way, onboarding is not very easy. For the larger companies, it takes a lot of time and effort to, for example, for uh, large retail to find exactly where the data is that's relevant and sh send it to IBM Food Trust, right? And in fact, much of what we did over the last one, one and a half years, remember that period when we were working with the minimum viable ecosystem, was to try to be more efficient. So what took six months initially, now takes about three to four weeks to onboard a typical client on IBM Food Trust, right? So we build a few applications, but the model we want to, we have in mind is to get it, to, to use an analogy, it's like the Apple uh, uh, platform, right? We build the platform, we build a few applications just like Apple did with its, you know, few applications like mail and, uh, you know, um, and iMessage and others when they started, and let the ecosystem come in with the other applications, because for us, the real value is going to come from innovation from a whole bunch of players who, who realize how to deliver value to this food ecosystem based on the sh information that's getting shared in the system, right? And so that's the approach that we have taken. So like I said, at this point in time, we have a few applications, but we are spending a lot of our time in trying to provide what I, call, what I would call APIs or, or interfaces to, so that you, you, know, you can access the data and deliver value to the ecosystem. So this is a typical pattern of what happens with enterprise blockchain solutions, right? Just to give you, you know, just to recap in terms of the typical approaches, you identify a class of problems. So we talked about the food problem, the food waste, food freshness, et cetera. You identify the ecosystem that's relevant, the players who are relevant. You basically create a technology platform for information sharing, and the rules of the game, you know, in terms of the, will depend on the ecosystem, right? The level of comfort for sharing information varies from ecosystem to ecosystem. For food, there were a set of rules that we had to come up with working with that minimum viable ecosystem. And then once the, the, the platform's in place, 
you build a few applications yourself, and that you know gets things going, and then you invite the broader you know uh, software vendors and others to come in and deliver more value over time. That's basically the simple approach that we have taken. So, just to give you a quick sense of where this particular system is, you know, in fact, as far as I know, this is probably the largest non-cryptocurrency-based blockchain solution uh, that's out there, right? And in fact, you have about as of now about five million blocks in this blockchain, which is not, which is quite significant considering the fact that this just was commercially available in October of last year, right? And uh, there are about 50 plus clients in the system today, right? I mentioned, uh, and this shouldn't be a surprise because Walmart asked all its leafy green suppliers to join the system. That itself is a good chunk of clients who have joined the system. Okay, so this chart essentially, you know, the main point of this is I want to illustrate, uh, even though it's a marketing chart, but did you read, ignore the text on the left. Uh, what I want to focus on is the few elements of the solution that I think are very important, that is very typical of every blockchain solution, regardless of industry. There are five pillars, if you will, or five elements to it. Uh, and the first one is e ecosystem. Right, you got to start with a set of problems that defines an ecosystem that you want to convene. You got to bring them in, which means you got to get the business model, which is the second element, right? You got to make sure that everybody gets something out of it. It's not easier said than done. It's extremely difficult to make. Just to give you an example, in the food trust solution, most of the suppliers said, "Why am I taking the pain of uploading information into the system? You know, what am I getting in return?" And so Walmart then had to basically say, I will do store scans to tell you exactly where your batches of strawberries that came to us, you know, which store it was sold at, right? So that's what I meant by business model. Everybody should get something out of it. The third thing is governance, right? So let's say um, Driscoll's upload some data and says, I permission Walmart to see it, right? That's basically what the system does. So Walmart can see the data. So does Walmart, what can Walmart do with the data? Can they sell it? Can they share it? The un simple answer is no. In our system, who owns the data and uploads the data owns the data, which also means, interestingly, by the way, IBM owns none of the data in IBM Food Trust. Right? An interesting approach we had to take. By the way, that's not where we started. Governance taught us this is what the community is comfortable living with, and that's what we did. Right? So uh, governance, standards and interoperability. It'll, it's all very fine and dandy if basically IBM Food Trust is the only answer. But guess what? There will be other solutions that are similar, right? That others may come up with. So we had to think upfront when we started building the solution. And this is also very typical. When you're building ecosystems, it takes a long time. So you may take a year, two years to get to a certain point. Somebody else might build something similar too. So then you have to think about interoperability. So, yeah, on, uh, so consciously we decided that we'll use certain data standards. We use something called GS1 which is a standard that's adopted in supply chains. It's being used in multiple industries, in drug uh, uh, serialization uses GS1, for example. And we picked that on purpose to ensure that it's possible to uh, you know, uh, interoperate with systems that may be de developed by others in future. Yeah? And the final piece is the technology itself. Of course, you've got to get the information and platform to work well. And the technology itself should embed much of the governance rules. And this is very important. Now, let me give you an example. So in IBM Food Trust, for example, if I remember I said you want third parties to come in and deliver value to the ecosystem, we provide APIs. The way we have structured it is, the, let's say you know, a company wants to create a, you know, an application for waste management. That company doesn't need to know anything about the permissioning in the system. They just write the waste management application accessing certain data. The system will make sure that only data that you know, you know, somebody's allowed or permission to see is surfaced in the APIs, right? So we take care of all that hard work. That's basically how this thing works. So technology also takes quite a bit of effort. So these are the five elements of any typical enterprise blockchain solution, right? Ecosystem, business model, you know, uh, governance, and uh, you know, data and interoperability standards, and finally the technology itself. Okay, so what I wanted to walk you through is in a few examples of how people are using this, right? So the first one is, this example is the one I mentioned, car for, and how they're using it. They're using it in Spain, by the way, so bear with me.
En Carrefour trabajamos de forma permanente para satisfacer las necesidades de nuestros clientes. Por ello, contamos con nuestro pollo campero calidad y origen, criado sin tratamientos antibióticos. A partir de ahora, mediante la tecnología blockchain, puedes obtener toda su información. Carrefour es la primera empresa de distribución en España en implantar esta nueva tecnología, la cual garantiza a nuestros clientes una total transparencia en la trazabilidad de nuestros productos. Solo necesitas un lector de códigos QR. A través del código impreso en la etiqueta del envase, obtendrás toda la información asociada a la trazabilidad del producto, desde la fecha y lugar de nacimiento, al tiempo exacto de cría y su alimentación, hasta la fecha de envío a nuestros almacenes de Carrefour. Essentially, what we did there was, so, you know, if you, if you walk into a, you know, grocery store in Spain, and that particular brand of chicken, if, you know, if you buy, there's a QR code, you scan the QR code, and it'll tell you about when the chicken was hatched, when it was slaughtered, and, you know, whether it was antibiotic-free, et cetera, et cetera, right? All that information is being surfaced from IBM Food Trust with data that's being sent by various players. Now, in this particular case, what Carrefour decided to do was, since they felt that the first place they wanted to start was give information back to the end consumer, they wrote a mobile application, right, that accesses the data in our platform using these APIs that I talked about, right, these uh, interfaces that I talked about. So that's how this works, right? So here's a, you know, a good example of something that is in production today. Nestle. Nestle basically wanted to focus on a slightly different problem. They were interested in baby food and especially multi-ingredient items like baby food and being able to track, trace back and forth, right? So if there's a problem with, you know, you know let's say one of these, uh, you know, uh, little tubs of baby food, you know, you want to know all ingredients and where they came from, right? That's basically what they're interested in. In other words, they're interested in what I would call multi-ingredient trace, is, right? You want to know if it's, I don't know, what is this one? If it's, yeah, sweet potato, potato apple pumpkin puree, where do the sweet potatoes come from, which farm? which batch went into making this particular bottle or this tub. And that's basically what our system is able to do. So technologically, we are ready to handle multi-ingredient trace back, which basically, by the way, means also, you know, conceptually, there's a big leap you can make here, right? Remember I said all the key ideas, tell us what came in, what you did with it, and what you shipped out. This can be used for aircraft parts provenance too. It can be used for other th things too, drugs, etc. It's not just for food. But anyway, that's basically a detail. All right, a third example is what we're doing, uh, partnering with Golden State Foods. So Golden State Foods is a big supplier to restaurants of various items like beef patties and things like that, right? Hamburgers. Fresh beef basically is being used in hamburgers in certain fast food chains, as you know by now. So what they wanted to do was pilot this idea of, you know, keeping track of not just what came in and what left and what was processed, but also keep track of temperature information and keeping track of things with RFID, right? What they did here was very interesting, right? You walk into a restaurant, you know, somebody picks something out of the freezer to basically make, you know, hamburgers. As they walk out, the RFID basically is able to tr read and, you know, in fact, a light comes up on, you know, at the on the freezer door, you know, green if basically, you know, they pick the right case and, you know, and red if they picked a case that, you know, was not supposed to pick. In other words, you want to pick the case that is going to expire soon, right? That basic idea. And so things like that, you know, are, are completely automated and data from these, these sensors coming directly into IBM Food Trust, right? This, by the way, is an important principle we use in blockchain solutions. Blockchain solutions are, are typically, you know, everybody says blockchain is very trusted, secured, data store, which is all very true. But it has a garbage in, garbage out problem, right? If bad data is sent in, you're keeping bad data in a trusted ledger, right? So you want to get the data as much as possible directly from primary sources and directly from devices if possible, as opposed to human beings being in the loop, right? So those are some of the principles that we use with blockchain solution. So this gives you hopefully a you know, good view of how, you know, the IBM Food Trust solution works. Next, I want to move into, in the next last few minutes, uh, a second solution. And by the end of the solution, you'll see the pattern I said is very clear, right? So here, what we're talking about is uh, the global trade 
ecosystem, right? Think about global trade. In fact, you, it doesn't matter what you buy in, you know, at a department store. There's a high likelihood that you know it came in a nice steel box on a big ship, right? These days, right? Eighty percent of most things consumers buy, you know, typically is you know coming on a spent some time of its life cycle on a container ship. It's a big sixteen trillion dollar, uh, you know, global trade. Uh, business, right? And, but this, this um, global trade is fraught with inefficiencies. And it's related to two primary things. One is, you know, it's very hard because of the many handoffs to know exactly where things are, right? Because just imagine something, something you know, toys for Christmas shipped from, you know, China to the US. You know, it, it maybe it went to the port of Shanghai, it went on a truck, and it went, went by a ship to Long Beach, California, then it went by truck again. Along the way, there were ports it, ports it touched, customs it touched, you know, customs officers and others who did inspections, many, many players. And therefore, it's hard to keep track of where things are. That's one aspect. The second aspect of it has got to do with the fact that um, it's very paper-based and uh, document-heavy processes. Just imagine shipping, you know, certain goods like, I don't know, f uh, food items. You may need a phytosanitary certificate, right? Depending on the goods, you need different things. In different regions, the regulations are different, et cetera, et cetera. So it gets quite complicated. So let's start with problems, just like we did in food safety. So some of the challenges in this ecosystem have to do with data is trapped in silos, right? A uh, simple example of that is, let's say I'm a shipper or a CPG company who basically ships uh, on container sh uh, containers. When I get a bill for the logistics service, the bill will have many components, right? You know, there will be a trucking component at either end, there will be carrier, uh, meaning the ship, the shipping carrier, their component, there will be freight forwarder fees perhaps, or it was stuck in the port of Long Beach, California for 20 days, demerit charges. How do you know it's right? What do they do today? They make phone calls, and that's how they do it. If we basically can keep track of the container as it moves through, think of FedEx tracking for containers, and keep track of it in a, in a shared in environment, a trusted shared environment, th when you get the bill, you don't have to make those phone calls. You know immediately from, say, uh, a solution uh, like you know, Trade Lens, which is the trade uh, code name for what we're building here, and you're able to reconcile um, bills or, you know, so that you can green light them if there's a match. And if there isn't, of course, you go back to, you know, figuring out what went wrong, right? Processes are extremely time consuming also, right? And this has got to do with the fact that, you know, a lot of the steps are done manually when it comes to this cross-border trade. A third area which we already, uh, you know, sort of I'm, I alluded to is customs related paperwork, right? It, it, and it can be incredibly expensive. I'll give you an example of something we experienced, right? So we will, when we started on this project almost two and a half, three years ago, we looked at a you know, shipment of avocados from Mombasa in Kenya to Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Typically, the actual physical movement of the container costs about $2,000. So that steel box, you pay $2,000 to the carrier to move the stuff. The, because avocados go bad, what they do is, and you don't want any block at the customs, they ship all the paperwork by, you know, uh, by air to Netherlands, right? And the amount of paperwork can be such that the total amount spent on the paperwork can be of the order of $400 for the $2,000. That's a significant number if you think about it. That's the level of inefficiency we're talking about. And so what we could do here is the entire workflow on paper, paper, you try to capture. First, there's a digitization benefit. Second is the trusted approval workflows, right? So to ensure that things work correctly. That's basically what uh, you know we can do with it. And I, I think this we already touched upon. So those are some of the challenges. And the challenges occur because, again, of the fact that all these various players, from customs to ocean carriers to freight forwarders to ports and all that, they basically are used to sending these point-to-point -point communication that I started with, right? That's really the problem. And what we want to get to is this model that all of these players have 
a trusted information sharing platform that they use. And that's basically what we call Trade Labs, right? And the platform is where basically much of the information is shared. So everybody then has a clear view of where the container is or where the customs paperwork are, et cetera, et cetera. Again, see the analogy is very similar to what is happening in Food Trust. And by the way, every blockchain solution enterprise that I've seen has this sort of common elements. But for this to work, you can immediately see how, e how difficult it is also. Just like there, it was very difficult to get the entire ecosystem, the farmers, the supplies all onto the system. So also onboarding this entire set of players is a slow process. Overnight, you can't get everybody onto the system. Right now, we are at a point where we have got a 100 participants who are on, uh, on trade lens today, but that has taken you know, off the order of you know, several months to get to this spot. So the story here is, again, very similar in terms of a timeline. In, it actually started in 2016 when I actually was on a phone call when I was running a lab in India with uh, somebody at Maersk, a head of strategy, uh, and I pitched, hey, look, we have this idea. Would you like to work with us? And as just as it happened in the food case, there was skepticism initially. And by the way, why did we go to Maersk? You should already know the answer, right? If you want to move the ecosystem, you want to start with one big player. Maersk moves about 20% of the, of the containers globally. So you start with somebody who is a key dominant player so that you can build from there, right? That's the reason why we approached Maersk. And so that's another you know, idea for you know, building blockchain solutions. We basically demonstrated, you know, just like we did the Mango pilot, we demonstrated in March that you know, there is potential here. Once they were convinced, we basically announced that we're going to build this thing and engage the ecosystem. And then over the several months since then, we created an early version of the technology to engage the ecosystem. And then we basically started get, talking to carriers, ports, customs, et cetera, to get onto the system. We went through the same thing of, you know, who does, does everybody benefit from it, right? What can we do to structure things so that everybody will share data in the system? So the governance, the business model, the standards, et cetera, we went to the exact same process to you know, get to a point and look at the timeline. It took a while. So last December, we finally said, now we are ready for prime time. So now trade lens is available for anybody to join. And basically, the business model here is uh, you know, um, you know, per container for use of the trade lens platform, you pay a certain amount to, to us. Right? Same thing in the food trust scenario, too. Basically, those apps I mentioned, like the Trace app, you pay the subscription-based model per month, you pay a certain amount, but all the prices are on the IBM website, or you pay per transaction, because some things you have to look at volume of transactions too, because that's how, that's how the cost is related to that, so the revenue should be related to that. So today then, uh, you know, on a daily basis, we get about 1.5 million events on trade lens, right? So it is in production, and when things are in production, it, it can be quite exciting and interesting. Uh, and you can have some tense moments too. Maybe I'll mention one of that later. Anyway, so, and then we basically have several million events on the system. Here you give an example of some of the com companies that we have on board onto, onto, the, onto the system, right? So that's basically where we are in the, in the, in the, in the trade lens journey. So I think you know, I, I covered most of these things. So trade lens then basically is essentially you, you know, the solution that brings all the entire ecosystem together to do information sharing. Here also, now, uh, there are three elements to these blockchain solutions. First and foremost, it's the business network itself. That's the ecosystem, the players you assemble. The second is the actual technology platform for sharing the information, which is where all the blockchain uh, you know, magic resides. And by the way, I didn't say much about smart contracts with blockchains. Uh, maybe I should have mentioned that, so maybe I'll take a moment to mention that. You know, If you look at the example I showed about beef moving through the supply chain, what if there is a dispute between the uh, supplier of the beef patties and the restaurant. Because the data is on a blockchain, you can run business logic that, you know, so let's say one party says, you know, you know, you didn't handle the temperature properly, and the other party says, no, 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 I did, right? You can actually do uh, run uh, algorithms on the data 
to come back with an automated answer. No, there's no problem with you know the temperature, right? So you can so essentially you can run smart contracts on the data in the blockchain is the point of making. So anyway, so there is the network layer, then there is the platform where all the information sharing happens and the smart contracts run. And then finally, there is the application layer, right? Which is where, you know, third parties also could come in and deliver value to the network. So there is ecosystem, the technology platform, and various applications that run on top of it. That's the model, I think, in terms of time. Okay. So I want to talk about what are the two applications that we have currently in trade lines, right? One of them is this visibility application. This literally what it tells you is exactly where is the container and how long did it spend in each location. So it literally, this is like you know, FedEx tracking. Now it seems like a simple idea, but it's very complicated because things change all the time, right? Rerouting and things like that happen. And imagine when there are many, many players, nobody has a clue where things are, right? So this can be extremely useful. The second is documents. And I mentioned customs, but it's not just customs. There's a whole set of documents that basically are involved in the in the global shipping process, like you know, off the order of 18, 20 documents. And thus, to ensure that these documents are selectively shared with the parties that are relevant to a shipment, that's basically the second application that you would develop on the TradeLens platform. These are just the two starter apps, and hopefully others will develop more applications to leverage the capability of sharing in this in this platform. Yeah? So I think, and then this is basically the same idea of providing APIs to access the data for third parties to be able to develop applications. I think I'll just play a short video clip of how TradeLens sort of works today. Every day, the world sees millions of shipping containers in motion. A minor miracle of logistics, coordination, and communication, but, how well can you see the ones that matter most to you? TradeLens is a blockchain-powered shipping solution that brings unprecedented transparency, trust, and collaboration to global supply chains. TradeLens offers the oversight, control, and management every stakeholder in the supply chain needs. Ocean carriers, ports, terminal operators, inland carriers, shippers, freight forwarders, customs authorities, financial service providers, and more. TradeLens has a powerful API model, but it's easy to use the web interface to deliver value and insights right out of the box. To help illustrate the impact of TradeLens, let's follow 480 LED televisions from inland China through a series of events, including arrival at the port of Savannah to their final destination in Dublin, Georgia. TradeLens lets us find our container through a range of search parameters, such as equipment number, bill of lading number, booking number, and more. Viewing the container shipment card shows the important information related to the container shipment. In the transport plan, you can see the key milestones on the shipment's timeline. While this shipment contains over 50 events, TradeLens supports over 120 planned, estimated, and actual events all tracked instantaneously, all viewable at the click of a button, giving detailed insights up and down the supply chain. Powerful filters can be applied to the events list, a capability that allows for isolating entries with document associations. Structured or unstructured documents can be uploaded or published to TradeLens by an array of providers. When this happens, an encrypted hash of each document is stored in the TradeLens blockchain. Perhaps the most significant aspect of TradeLens is the dynamic and sophisticated ability to control who has access to view and manage documents at each stage of a shipment, providing an encrypted audit trail of all critical actions. The benefits of TradeLens really deliver when the planned turns into the unplanned. At the early stages of this journey, an unforeseen circumstance leads to a change in the transport plan. Due to newly imposed draft restrictions, the carrier must discharge the container in Busan. From there, the container is booked upon a second vessel, lengthening the ocean voyage to Savannah by 36 hours. The carrier's decision has implications not just for them, but for all stakeholders further down the supply chain. 
from customs brokers, port authorities and terminal operators to inland transporters and consignees. With TradeLens, changes to this shipment are reflected immediately, allowing supply chain partners to tightly coordinate actions, delivering the consignee's inventory in Dublin with 36 fewer hours than originally planned. TradeLens allowed near-instant logistical adjustments, so disruption was kept to a minimum. Global trade is an incredibly complex system, but with TradeLens and blockchain technology, we now have a trusted solution to support industry-wide innovation. TradeLens. Okay, so I'll end with one final thought, right? So in, if, if you think about this, um, there are solutions or blockchain networks being formed to solve specific problems in certain industries, right? Now take these two solutions itself. Maybe food is going on a container ship, right? And maybe Walmart is then on both solutions, right? So then the question of how do you interoperate comes into play, right? And so while because of ecosystem complexity reasons, these blockchain networks are forming independently, you got to think of them not just as islands, but you got to think about bridges between them. And the concept is essentially this notion of a network of networks. That's basically the way this is evolving, right? And so each blockchain solution network is created for a certain set of problems in a certain ecosystem, the way I described, and then they are over time connected. And the simplest example I can think of is, remember the trade finance network that I said that we trade uh, uh, that I mentioned earlier? Think about a container being delivered at destination. The moment it is delivered, maybe the payment can happen in the trade finance network. So you need to have that interoperability. And so a lot of time we are spending on is how to make sure that these blockchain solution networks interoperate with each other to add additional business value, right? So hopefully this gives you a, a good sense of how blockchain is being used in enterprise settings, right? And I didn't talk much about cryptocurrencies and all that. That's primarily because of the type of technology that we're using. Much of the work and effort is in this building of the ecosystem and ensuring that people are able to share information, do interesting things with the data. So we do have time for some questions, and we do have a procedure for questions, and the procedure is that there are people with microphones, and microphones have polychrome on them, and if you keep your hand up long enough, eventually a microphone will come to you, and I will call on you by the color of your phone. And when I do, please stand, tell us your name, tell us if you're a member, and ask a question. Speeches are reserved for the social hour. And I... Yes. I am going to ask the first question because there's a part of this talk that seemed to me you didn't give probably because I gave you the wrong information. But could you tell us a little bit about the underlying hardware and software structure that is being implemented for these blockchain solutions that involve all these different parties? Who is running the computers? Are they all running on their own computers? How much computing power does it take? And uh, I'm sorry, being a little bit long-winded here, but um, in block, in crypto country, in cryptocurrency, there are these miners who get the right to add the block. Probably, that's not how this works. Yeah. And uh, so, could you just say a few words about how this whole thing is implemented? Yeah. So, in both the solutions I talked about, the underlying technology uses what is called the hyperledger fabric I mentioned, right? And Essentially, uh, let's take the example of food trust. Today, we basically have off the order of about uh, half a dozen nodes running in IBM Food Trust. Who runs those nodes and where does it run? The nodes are essentially you know, in the control or ownership of independent parties called trust anchors. So Walmart is a trust anchor, Carrefour is a trust anchor, IBM is a trust anchor, right? So a few entities. Where are these nodes running today? They're running in the IBM cloud, and essentially they are, think of them as a typical, you know, uh, you know, CPU, right? It's very simple. There's nothing complicated there. And as, so think of them as independent computers running, and they're networked together. That networking is done by this uh, 
this capability called the IBM blockchain platform, which also I kind of hinted at, right? That, that's how they're brought together. These together then start providing the, the service of storing transactions that is coming in from the food trust platform, right? So in the case of Tradelands, it's very similar. Each carrier runs his or her own node. Everybody else in the ecosystem don't run blockchain nodes. In Food Trust, most players don't run blockchain nodes. To them, the whole solution is like software as a service. But they do trust the data that's in the system because these trust tankers that run their corresponding nodes, they basically are completely independent parties who are running this. And we make sure that there are enough trust tankers so that there's no chance of collusion. So that's the way that works. And the nodes themselves basically, like I said, they're just running copies of Hyperledger Fabric along with something called the orderer service, along with something called the certificate authority, which basically is which with the component that issues credentials. But this is basically how this works. Okay, questions from the audience. Go. Take Tim first, and then one of those two guys over there, and then the other one can get it after the person in the back with the orange microphone. So we'll start with Mr. Blue. Uh, Timothy Red. Thomas, I'm a member. Um, the, at the core, you have to be certain that these documents have not been altered. You mentioned a hash, right? Yeah. That everyone puts on their document. But how do we know <coughs> that this is maintained throughout the chain is that does that make any sense yeah as a question? so yeah so there are two parts to you know being careful about trusting the data one is once the data gets into the system and one is before it gets into the system right once it gets into the system regardless of you know uh, let's say it's shared with others etc cetera, etc cetera, there is audit trails of everything that's happening on these trust anchor nodes therefore there's no worry of things going wrong once it gets into the system. The big worry is when you know things are outside of the system. So for example, in the case of trade lens, if a customs officer decides to take a bribe before signing off on a transaction on a document, the blockchain doesn't know about it, right? So this is why I said there are two problems with, uh, with data coming in documents or otherwise any data coming in. One is essentially people make mistakes. So garbage in, garbage out. The second is people, you know, could do malicious actions, right? That to prevent both to the extent possible, we recommend sending data directly from IT systems. Even IT systems can be hacked, but you know, just in other words, make it harder and harder. Securing the edge is a key part of what we do. In fact, there is a whole slow work going on in IBM research under the general uh, category of what is called crypto anchors. And the entire goal there is to ensure that you make things as secure as possible on the edge. So it's not just that you trust the data in the blockchain, but make sure what comes in is also trusted. Mr. Red. Adam Jacobson, I'm not a member of the society. You mentioned the documents and information put onto these blockchains are permissioned so that only certain people can read them. How are those permissions enforced? So the way these uh, per permissioning works in these systems is um, explicit sharing happens in most cases, in which case basically all you have to do is ensure that, you know, that explicit share is all we allow, right? Now, the harder problem is when somebody accesses data via API and ensuring that we respect the permissions. So the way this works in IBM Food Trust today is every time a piece of data comes in, it goes through an entitlement process. The entitlement process looks at the entire history of shares and makes sure that this particular data is visible to only the parties in history who have some reason to, to see it. Let me make it explicit. But if I'm a farmer who you know, grows strawberries and I upload the data to the system, at the point in time when I uploaded the data, I do not know whether it's going to go to Kroger or Walmart. So I cannot explicitly share with either of them. But later on, the farmer shipped it to Driscoll's, but later on Driscoll ships it to Kroger, let's say. 
At that point in time, when Driscoll sends us the data saying, I ship this to Kroger, at that point we know that, you know, okay, the, the Kroger can see the farmer's data. That's what I meant by this entitlement process. So we actually have a very sophisticated algorithm that take, make sure that you know you respect the wishes of the people who upload their data. And by the way, we give we create an extreme scenario here to ensure that people are comfortable sharing. The way IBM Food Trust works is any data you upload, you can specify who can see the data explicitly or implicitly saying if somehow somebody down the supply chain gets to see my product, then the data can be shared. Hope that helps. I have some further questions. Okay. I'll ask them afterwards. We have another question. Uh, there's an orange back there, and we'll come back to the red after that. Uh, yeah. Thanks again for your insights earlier in today. Name? Are you? Uh, a member? Yeah, Ravi Deepak. Um, Are you a member? Uh, not a member, just okay. a guest. And uh, thank you again for your insights. If data is the new oil, and like I consider the machines and the people the uh, engines, what industries do you think are going to be ripe for disruption in the next, on, on IBM's horizons as far as the hyperledger is concerned? So, could you repeat the question? <laughs> uh, I said if data is the new oil and the people in the machines are perhaps the engines or what I consider the engines, what industries would the hyperledger go after to disrupt in the future? So, I think the, the places where we are seeing the most traction I would say are in a few select industries uh, or domains. Supply chain is one, clearly, where we are seeing a tremendous traction. Second is financial services. Uh, third is in the government sector on identity and things like that. Decentralized identity, I didn't talk about it. It's a very exciting area. And, then the, and the last one is healthcare, where you know patient consent, you won't have control of the data you share. So it's really in places where you have sensitivities around I information sharing, which eventually turns out to be all industries. But these are the ones where the traction is, I see the traction near term. Mr. Red, too. Mm -hmm. oh, Will Angel, I am not a member. Could you talk about the scalability and sustainability of, of blockchains and commerce compared to traditional relational data or unstructured databases? Yeah, so in... Uh, in the hyperledger fabric, in permission blockchains in general, you have to come up with an algorithm that you know helps you to come to an agreement across all the nodes that the next transaction can be committed. This is what goes by the term consensus, right? When it comes to uh, permission blockchains where all the parties are known, Standard algorithms from computer science going back to 20, 30 years ago, going back to Leslie Lamport's algorithm, the RA consensus, there are plenty of algorithms very well known, suffice. These are just standard distributed computing algorithms. They don't solve difficult math puzzles like the proof of work and proof of stake that you might see in, in Bitcoin or Ethereum. And so, you know, these are orders of magnitude, orders of magnitude, you know, cheaper than what Bitcoin or Ethereum is. In fact, today in the Hyperledger fabric, we can run thousands of transactions per second, no problem, right? So it, this is very different technology. I didn't spend much time on the technology details, but it, and the reason is also partly because the computer science behind what happens in Hyperledger fabric and all this is decades old. The key insight or to, uh, that was brought into the picture by Bitcoin and Ethereum is, there is a certain combination of things that you bring together, decentralized control, digital uh, signatures, and uh, this notion of consensus that can be very powerful. And that revived old algorithms, you know, you know, brought together in a specific recipe, and that's what the hyperledger fabric is. Mr. Abu, Carl Merrill, I'm a member. Um, on one hand, you said that uh, it seemed to be a cooperative and different groups run their own no nodes, but on the other hand, it sounds like it's all run on an IBM computer on the internet, so I'm a little confused as to how yeah, it so could be cooperative that way. And then the other question I had was, um, I, I didn't hear any mention of anything like a smart tag on the items so that you'd have an independent way of knowing what was going on. Yeah, 
So there were two questions in there. Um, the first one is, it looks like all of this is running on the IBM cloud, right? It's all in IBM's control. So first and foremost, you know, um, running on the IBM cloud doesn't mean it's all in IBM's control, but let's leave that aside. The bigger point I want to mention is, the, uh, it's, it's a point in time statement that, you know, IBM Food Trust is running that way. The real way to think about it, these nodes are just computer nodes that can run anywhere. But given where things are in, in terms of the life cycle of this technology, you want to make sure that you, know, you don't suffer from the weakest link problem. So you're running a serious business on a set of nodes. And if one party manages the node poorly, that could cause problems in the system. So because of that, we said, let's start slowly and ensure we have initially run these nodes in the IBM cloud. But over time, these blockchain nodes can run in other clouds or on-premise. That's precisely the path we are on. It's because that's the right approach. These nodes should be completely in the independent control of the parties, right? They are not now because, like I said, it's part of a journey that we are going through, right? But the intent is, and in fact, our roadmap is literally to go in that direction. Second part of the question are smart tags. Remember I mentioned crypto anchors? That's precisely an idea like that. In other words, you can, say, take a, you know, in fact, we are doing a project with uh, Everledger, which is involved in diamond powers. And what we have done there is you take some sort of a digital fingerprint of the diamond at source, and you upload it onto the blockchain. And now I don't need to, you know, yes, there's value to keeping track of the diamond as it goes through, but independently, at destination, I can do a check against the digital fingerprint. So these are all, think of them as complementary techniques to add more and more trust to the provenance. So that's precisely what we're doing. So if somebody has the orange microphone in the back there, please. Yes, hi, Luke Idziak. A quick question about the hardware you would use. Can you talk more about what kind of temperature sensor, transmission sensor you would have on a shipping container, on the inside of a shipping container? How would you stop uh, you know, a stack of shipping containers from stopping your signal, for example, these sorts of things. Thank you. Yeah, actually, could you be a little louder? The last part I didn't get. Sure. How would you integrate your sensors in such a way so that you could stop the signal from being transmitted if the container is buried on the inside of a stack? How would you communicate information from subunits inside of a container to the outside of the container? Yeah. So, uh, you know, in terms of uh, information coming out of the container, there could be losses, perhaps, right? As far as the system is concerned, right? What information it was it received is what it operates with. So typically in containers, you know, there are these reefer containers or refrigerated containers. That's the short form for reefer con uh, refrigerated containers. They have sensors in them, and you know there could be pockets where they don't have communication back, in which case you don't get the data. But that's okay, right? From the point of view of the system that I've talked about, you know, as long as you know you you you're able to track the container and get the information, the, you know, some information is better than no information, right? So there will be losses along the way. Same thing in the food supply chain. When beef patties are being tracked, we are getting temperature information. But what if basically, you know, the, uh, the truck is down, right? And, the, and, you know, you won't get temperature information. So you will have losses, but you'll, it's all timestamp based. So you are able to analyze and, you know, get to as close to the truth as possible. Right? But things that are outside of the control, like this customs officer taking a bribe or you know, lack of information coming in, there's nothing you can do about it. Technology is not going to be able to solve it. Greg? Um, yeah, no, Greg. I can, uh, I can see the first half of it, how somebody has a, I can see the first half, how someone could order something, the order can be put through, the material can go on and get shipped out. But how does it know it's being received? So. Every party along the way is constantly sending us information, right, about the items that they're receiving and they're sending out. So what the system does in terms of algorithms is link all that information. So there's trusted data and there's a linking process or the provenance piece that we do in IBM Food Trust. And that's one of the sort of smarts in the system, if you will, that's able to do it. Greg? Uh, I'm Joe Griffin, I'm, I'm a member. I, I wonder if you'd be willing to let me imagine that I'm an executive at some stage in an industry that has become blockchain substantially. Then the first question is, if I'm in that industry, can I join? 
Is that the process by which the uh, the procedure grows across the industry? And then, the, but the real question I ask, if I'm an executive, there's an operating blockchain system with many of my colleagues and competitors. When I join, do I join because I'm going to pay less and get more for my bookkeeping and management uh, data handling? Or do I join because I'm going to get so much more that I'm willing to pay more? Uh, I, uh, yeah, so I, I think your question is one of, is it efficiencies or is it you know growth, right? You know, cost efficiencies or revenue expansion. I think it's a mix of both, but in, in most of these solutions that we're building, given it's an early technology, people are very um, conservative. Right? So, they, so they go for direct benefits. So most projects I see are going after efficiencies. But I think the real value of these technologies, with this, the enabled by the sharing that is happening, will be when business models change and there'll be new growth opportunities. In fact, let me give you an example. In IBM Fortress, we just, the data that we get for Trace, it's the same data that enabled us to build those freshness applications. So it's, so, right? So, so you don't have to justify the collection of the data or getting onto the system with just one application. There are many more downstream that you can develop. That's when we realized also you want to open it to the ecosystem, let innovation right happen. And the data is going to be cheaper. Could you not? Could That's you not right. do that? Could you not have a conversation if you don't have a microphone? Thank you. Hi. Hello. Good evening. Um, my name is Balaji, a non-member in Nigeria. And I'm interested in understanding how this will play out for <clears throat> the SMEs, uh, especially in for in a country, for example, where the many information is not very very structured. It's very very disorganized, and you know you're also trying to come up with an innovation that probably can work for your government. Uh, I want I want to understand. I want to take like understand or your opinion or your view on the approach. Um, SMEs can take, you know, maybe in you know working or partnering with government, for example, in customs, for example, and yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think I'll address the SME question by look, looking at the little farmer as an example, right? So typically, you know, what you want is to keep, keep the barriers as low as possible. So one of the things that you know for information sharing to happen is. Well, how do you keep the barrier low? Is to make it free. So for example, that's what we did. In IBM Food Trust, if you want to upload information alone, but you don't want to experience any of the apps that are at the, at the top, it's free. And this makes it easy for Walmart to also tell its leafy green supplies, please join IBM Food Trust because you don't have to pay anything, right? So part of it is essentially, you know, you, this, is, this is related to that aligned incentive thing that I mentioned earlier, ensuring everybody gets something out of it. Part of it is you may have to sometimes subsidize some players. In both these examples, we are not, but I think that's some a principle that you know I often look for. There are cases where you may have to subsidize some parties to join the ecosystem to benefit everybody. Other questions? Ah, okay. Hi, Lee Brooks, not a member. Uh, you talk about improving efficiencies along the supply chain and uh, in, in, in the food uh, supply chain. But uh, you mentioned algorithms and things like that for uh, you know recognizing smart contracts where there's problems along the way. Are you building those algorithms? Are, or is Walmart or Maersk building those algorithms? Are those running across the whole ecosystem or just on each node? And you know if they're running across or you're having one on one node, how does it you know learn from the others? Then if it's only running on one, and who owns that? Then is that you, them, or the entire ecosystem? Yeah, so it's a great question. Actually, um, most smart contracts are run by the parties themselves, right? So, and the way, the, the mental model you should have is the following, right? So we use a few trust anchors to ensure that all data is vouched for in the system, okay? And then, let's say any two companies, Driscoll's and Walmart, have to run some uh, a smart contract. What they would do is, they tell IBM we want to do that, which, which basically means they start building their own private nodes 
and the data that's relevant for those two parties will be copied over from the trust anchor channels, to use a hyperledger channel, hyperledger terminology, over to these nodes so that they can run their own independent smart contracts. They can do whatever they want. In fact, IBM will not know anything about what they're doing. This is a true blockchain where you can have thousands of nodes, each doing his own thing. But this trust anchor concept we came up with primarily because you need some mechanism to keep track of all the information and vouch for them. The reason is, like I gave that example earlier, when the little farmer is uploading his information, he doesn't know where it's going to go. So that's why we came up with this sort of interesting approach. Uh, I didn't want to get into the details of that, but that's basically how it works. So effectively, companies run their own smart contracts. At this point today in IBM Fortress, you cannot do that. But at the end of this month, we'll have the first version of that ability for others to run their own smart contracts. Last questions? We got three, three more questions. So, okay, let's blue mic, red mic. Is there any way to keep criminal? Tell us Hi. Are you a member? Have you considered ways of What's keeping your name? crim? My name's David Rosen. Are you a member? Lifetime member. Thank you. Uh, have you have you thought about ways of keeping uh, uh, criminals and and terrorists and rebellious people out of the system so that they don't use it? I'm not talking about malware. I mean people who use it to, and, and really shouldn't. Yeah. So for uh, IBM Food Trust in particular, we have not thought about that other than, like I said, right? You know, we know all the parties who, who come to the system, right? And they have to digitally sign before they send any transaction. That's as far as we have done. Specifically, you know, we have not worried about terrorists trying to attack the system. The, 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 That's the type of system using it. Using it for tracking. Yeah. We have not thought about it, no. We have not thought, maybe it's something when the volume grows big, it gets successful, much more successful. Maybe we'll have to think about it, but good question. I haven't thought about it, honestly. Okay. Red microphone, Bob. Hi, I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a member. Uh, could you give us some idea of the order of magnitude of costs? Suppose I have a $1,000 shipment of grapes. How much is the blockchain keeping track of it going to cost? So, um, it's hard to give us a number, but I, you know, think of it as basically uh, if it's a thousand dollars worth of goods, um, maybe pennies. Last question. Hey, Jan van Ypren, not a member. Um, you were talking about the different areas of implementation and the eventual maybe cross-pollination between the two areas for one client who makes use of the different areas. How hard is the inclusion? How hard is the, uh, how strict is the inclusion? Um, IBM is big, is, is doing this on a large scale, but there are other parties who are doing a similar thing. And perhaps one of the stakeholders in one, in your uh, blockchain service yeah. Uh, at a certain moment, sees somebody else and wants to um, maybe explore a different route. Yep. So how hard would it be for such a stakeholder to shift into another solution? Yeah, so um, the, remember I said this thing about interoperability and standards is important for us. Part of the idea there is also to, you know, not lock companies into what we're doing, right? Because really our, the, our principle is if we get it right in terms of having an information sharing platform that adds value to the entire ecosystem, beyond a certain point, critical mass will be achieved and we will basically be you know, a big chunk of it. But in the interim while that is happening, we wanted to make sure that nobody feels worried about joining our system. So for us, we want to make it as clear as possible that our, you know, that's why we chose standards like GS1, right? So if you if somebody else builds a system like IBM Fortress, chances are they're gonna use GS1 standards. So the data you are sending us, you just point in the other direction. That's basically what we, and, and in fact, we mean it when we say that. That's exactly what we want. 
Okay, with that, <coughs> before you go, Ramesh, I want to thank you for coming down here yep. from starting from yep. Geneva, as I understand it. That's this right, morning, it's 2 a.m. from Geneva. And into Dulles. Uh, I'm going to present you with this yep. framed copy of the announcement of your talk and a copy of the volume one of the bulletin of the Philosophical Society of Washington covering the period from March 1871 to June 1874. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much. So before we adjourn to the social hour, we have a few closing items. PSW depends on members and sponsors. If you're not a member, please consider joining. If you are a member, please consider giving a bit more. If you haven't paid your dues, please pay your dues. Or sponsoring a lecture and helping carry out the society's activities. You can apply for membership on the PSW website. All you have to do is go to the home page and go to the join button, which brings up the page that tells you about membership and has a membership link, which will bring up the application for membership, which when you fill it out and get to the bottom, will have a little button that says submit form, which will bring up the dues payment form, which you can use a credit card, you don't have to use PayPal. And when you submit that, it will <coughs> send your application to, uh, to the committee and it will be reviewed and we'll get back to you within about a week to 10 days. The only requirement for joining, well I should say, the main requirement for jo joining is that you have an interest in science. There's no IQ test and there is no credential, no threshold to overcome. So please consider joining. PSW is a nonprofit educational organization. It's tax exempt under section 501c3 of the Internal Revenue Code. Contributions are tax deductible to the extent permitted by law and your friends at the IRS. All PSW members in good standing can wear the PSW rosette. And if you are a member in good standing and wish to purchase one, if you've not done so already, you may do so at the rosette table at the back of the auditorium or you can do it through the web. The next lecture will take place on Oh, March 22nd, and the speaker will be Dagmar de Groot of Georgetown University. He will be speaking on the Dutch Republic and Colonial Ice Age and the ways in which the Dutch adapted to the prolonged cold climatic conditions of that time. In contrast to other cultures who at that time all fared far less well. And no doubt we'll have some comments on climate change. It's many of you uh, might expect. The rest of the spring schedule is complete and posted. After Dagamar, we have Mary Angela Lasante of Princeton, and she'll be speaking on dark matter. Uh, that lecture is sponsored by PSW member Erica Kane. On April 26th, we have Kim Janda of the Scripps Research Institute, and he'll be speaking about drug abuse vaccines in particular, he'll be talking about vaccination approaches to deal with the opioid epidemic. On April 29th, we have a special event. Alan Stern of New Horizons fame and Ron Eckers, recently president of the International Astronomical Union, will be having a civilized discussion slash debate on what the proper definition is of a planet, and in particular whether or not Pluto should be considered a planet or a dwarf planet or a Kuiper belt object. It should be a fun event and also I think informative on the sorts of considerations that go into defining terms like planet. The International Astronomical Union is uh, the scientific that makes many decisions about astronomical terms. And Ron is the person who was president at the time it was determined that Pluto isn't a planet. And Alan in the New Horizons mission went to Pluto and showed that at least it has a lot of features that might make you think it's a planet. And of course, Ron, Alan is a proponent of Pluto as a planet. 
and Ron probably is a proponent of Pluto as a dwarf planet. And then on May 17th, we had the 87th Joseph Hemi Lecture. The lecture will be Brian Keating of the University of California at San Diego and the Simons Observatory. And I'm hoping that his talk will be on inflation and the beginnings of all things. You might be interested in his book that he recently published, his sort of popular biography, but it relates to not winning the Nobel Prize and the influence of prizes like the Nobel Prize on science, scientists' motivations and how it can lead them to be a little hasty in coming to conclusions about their data. And it's a, an interesting book. So I commend it. The social hour ends promptly at 10.30. Please use the side exit to leave the building. And with that, I will accept a motion for adjournment of the 2,405th meeting of the society to the social hour. A second. All members in favor? Aye. All members opposed? The meeting is unanimously adjourned for the social hour.